Welcome to Regenera Rising. Today's theme is resilience and coming together. My name is Alicia Sacred Heart, one of the engineers here at the Vision Train, proudly hosting Design Science Studio for this virtual summit. And up next, we have Margie Marlowe. Margie is a deep believer in community care, interdependence and connection as world saving mechanisms. Executive Director and Founder of Guardians of the Vibe, an educational consent-based nonprofit since 2015, Margie finds joy in educational container and creating new ways of learning these important concepts. Margie believes that like the dandelion, a vital pollinating flower in medicine, we, are, we as a community can use the whole plant of consent bystander intervention, empowerment, and accountability to create a tonic to cure our environments, systems, public, and ourselves. Margie holds a bachelor degree in social science with a focus in sociology, gender studies, and leadership in social change, along with a double minor in psychology and Spanish language. Thank Welcome, you so Margie. Much for that intro. Hi. <laughs> what a potent last session. I know that uh, Oaken and Richard have gone to a breakout room, but that was very fitting, if I feel like, and leading us into this next subject. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Let's see. Can everybody see that? Yeah, looks great. Excellent. That's what we like to hear. Um, yes, thank you all so much for being here for Regenera Rising Summit. I know everyone's been working super hard. We are on day seven. Whoa wild. <laughs> um, so today I will be presenting about consent for a better world. And again, my name is Margie and I run Guardians of the Vibe, which is a nonprofit specifically based out of Portland, Oregon, but has the goal to spread consent internationally. So check us out on the internet, follow us on Instagram. And yeah, we'll just get right into it. So I always like to start the day with um, doing a land acknowledgement. Uh, we at Guardians of the Vibe and myself, Margie Marlowe, acknowledge the non-consensual nature of the stolen lands of Turtle Island that we are able to educate and create upon. We also urge our workshop participants to just take a moment to acknowledge the land that they are occupying while taking this class. And we also stand in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement and acknowledge the non-consensual white supremacist atrocities that Black people have historically and presently navigate. White supremacy is a non-consensual system and racism is a byproduct of that system, which we believe can be dismantled through education and compassion. I am located in what we now call Portland, Oregon, and Multnomah County, where the lands of the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Malala, Cowlitz, and Watala bands of the Chinook and many other tribes made their homes along the Columbia River. And today, people from these bands have become part of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde, the Confederated Tribes of the Silats Indians, and the Chinook Nation and Cowlitz Nation in Washington State. And I would just like to take a moment to also acknowledge that Native people are still actively creating, openly resisting white supremacy, stewarding the earth, and deserve land back and justice now. So let's just take a moment and resonate with where we are and where we're learning upon. And I believe there's a link in the chat um, to a sort of non-exhaustive map of the world where you can find um, who was occupying the land that you are on and who is presently occupying the land that you are on. If you'd like to learn more about the languages and broken treaties of your land, it is also an excellent resource, so check it out. So today the workshop, this is very much so like a crash course, if you will, of consent and bystander intervention 
and it will it's sort of to spark interest in uh, doing some more homework or taking more workshops on these topics, but hopefully you'll learn something new. Hopefully you'll gain some new skills along the way. Basically the beginning of it, I'll kind of talk a bit about guardians of the vibe and we'll kind of break down some like consent skills and then we'll do some bystander intervention skills and there'll be some questions scattered throughout the presentation, which y'all are welcome to take yourself off of mute for or put in the chat. Um, this is live stream, so if you would like to keep your commentary anonymous, please feel free to put it in the chat. Um, otherwise, feel free to take yourself off mute and share if there's a question uh, that pops up. So, um, Guardians of the Vibe is a 501c3, and we have the goal of providing consent and bystander intervention um, workshops, literature, um, curating spaces where these, you know, have a more like pinnacled goal in the space. So, so we do consultation and things like that. I started Guardians of the Vibe after I saw a need for it in uh, recreational event spaces such as festivals and music venues. Um, I took a consent workshop in 2015 at a festival and was just totally blown away and confused as to why I had never seen a space like that curated at a festival. So I uh, contacted the person who did that um, workshop named Danielle Dorman, and they helped create Guardians of the Vibe along with Erica Wren, B. Ogden, Alicia O'Patterney, and um, myself. Uh, we have been working as a team for that amount of time, and I would also like to give them credit for helping me put together some of these slides for some of our previous workshops. So it's our, it's our brainchild, and I'm very grateful that I get to share it with you all. So Guardians of the Vibe has the primary mission to educate and catalyze the full public spectrum of consent and bystander intervention. We consider consent to be an overarching public health need and believes that everybody deserves comprehensive education in this important concept. An informed, consent-minded public creates a viable public safety net where we empower and stand up for each other in times of need. In a society that is built on power imbalances, patriarchy, lack of education, and white supremacy, we are often not taught the necessary skills of how to create healthy boundaries and respect the boundaries of others or the planet that we live on. No matter who you are, we believe that you deserve this education so we can make a cultural shift towards a brighter and safer future. And that is just the vein that goes through our entire mission. And I'm so happy with how it has blossomed over time. I am impressed with the recreational spaces and festivals that I have seen implementing more consent-based policies and codes of conduct. Um, I am seeing just generally more, you know, more action with that. And so we are starting to move into educating uh, our more greater community, such as in schools and um, community centers, things like that. So let's see. So with kind of almost piggybacking off of what um, David and Stephen and Richard were talking about as far as like safe space and things like that, I oftentimes say that we are just in a safer space and that oftentimes we will kind of get uncomfortable talking about things that activate us, especially if it's things that we have either, you know, had bad experiences with in the past or are resistant maybe to learning more about. So I oftentimes like to refer to this container as a safer space. And some of the stuff that we do talk about when we talk about consent does kind of exist at the edge of some of our comfort zones. Um, but it's important to remember that growth begins at the end of your comfort zone and that sometimes receiving new information can activate you or make you feel uncomfortable. But I would say that I urge you to sit with it and push into the activation and sometimes you can come out of it learning a new skill. 
However, if you are feeling genuinely triggered or unsafe, please take care. You are welcome to, you know, uh, disengage if you need to. Uh, with no questions asked. So, um, we'll we'll be in this we'll be in this together. So we'll just get into it. Um, also, some of these slides are fruit themed. I thought about changing them for this uh, <laughs> for this workshop, but I don't know. I'm just like kind of vibing with the fruit themed slides. I think I'm going to keep them in there forever. <laughs> I did a, a consent workshop for the DSS called Roots to Fruit, and I think the fruit theme is great. Um, so consent as a definition in the dictionary is both a noun and a verb. It is the permission for something to happen or an agreement to do something, or it is to give permission for something to happen. But consent is just it's so much more than just permission like the permission is just like the tip of the iceberg and then you've got like all this other stuff at the bottom of it like how we're attuned to our emotions acknowledging our power our privileges reading nonverbal cues managing expectations understanding limits checking in and taking accountability for when we mess up and one of my favorite things that I've really been leaning into about consent recently is that consent is a regenerative practice that we get better at the more we use it and understand it. It's really infinite in how you can apply it to aspects of your life. And it is used in many different overarching systems or places that you occupy and even, you know, as we look at how we acknowledge you know, climate change or things like that. It's an overarching view of how we treat the earth and how we don't treat the earth with respect. So consent is used. We oftentimes see a lot of consent workshops that focus very much so on interpersonal relationships, such as dating, sex, interpersonal violence, rape culture, things like that. Sex is really the middle of the ripple when actually it's comes out it's very big picture so it goes all the way out into your dating life like you can use um consent with your family we oftentimes like use consent or engage in non-consent in our workplaces um we the environmental system is on the outside because i feel like our environment very much so it enforces a lot of where we do and do not practice consent and it also you know it is a place where we do not use consent when it comes to the earth and when it comes to how we are engaging with the planet itself um like for example littering a cigarette butt on the ground to me is a non-consensual action to the earth the earth did not consent to receiving a cigarette butt on the ground um and you know, the earth also does not consent to being fracked for natural resources and things such as that. So it's it's really a very big picture thing. And there are countless places where these concepts can be implemented. And I would encourage everyone in this workshop to look at the places that you occupy and, you know, think about where you can implement more consent based practices and um, where maybe there are there are not a lot of consent based practices used possibly towards yourself in those spaces. So hopefully as this workshop moves forward, you will have a grander view of where these kind of non consensual or consensual things pop up in your lifestyles. So in places where consent is heavily utilized and is centered, it, these are a couple of words that have come up in previous workshops that people have populated into questions. And these are like the top words that people come up with and consent makes people feel valued, respected, empowered, autonomous, and informed. And we really all just deserve to feel like that every day so how can we get there how can we like get to this like nice circle of pretty like positive words i'd say these are good feelings to have so this is what we would call a web of oppression which is a 
very common type of graph that's used in sociology. Um, I particularly liked this one because it's rainbow and actually is like, has a fairly good overarching idea of what we're looking at here. It is imperfect and there are, there is certainly room for criticism with certain aspects of it, but I would say that this is like a good first level web of oppression. Um, and I oftentimes will use it in my workshops to kind of break down how power and privilege work. Um, I would like to credit Sylvia Duckworth for making it. It is like all of her sociology based graphics are really easy to read and colorful and generally just very just I don't know she just does a really good job so check out Sylvia Duckworth's work if you are interested in um, graphs because there are a lot of them <laughs> um, so power dynamics and privilege play a very large role in how we give and receive consent the sociological definition of privilege is something of value uh, that one group has over another group and it doesn't mean that you necessarily like earned that it means that you simply by belonging to a group have a certain like societal allotment of power uh, many privileges um are you know something that you are given at birth and are things that you are just generally born with um if we take a look at this wheel the closer your privileges land in the middle, the more power you have societally and the more items that you have in the outer margin, the slightly less privileges or social power you might have available to you, depending on where you are. This kind of looks like, you know, I feel like a lot of the things on here are potentially global, but also this also has like a more United States centric, um, viewpoint i i can see i can tell but um i think that it is pretty overarching um as a whole um quick question to the leads are y'all letting people in from the waiting room i feel like you are yes okay thanks um so Privileges give people societal power, and power in general is not necessarily bad, but it can be and is often used as something to gain leverage or coercion or oppression towards folks who have less power and privilege. We like to think of power as something that can be manipulated and can be potentially utilized to uplift folks or empower people who maybe sit on the farther edges of the margins. So that is something that we can all work towards um, depending on where we hold power and privilege and we all hold power and privilege in different places i'm sure that some of y'all are looking at this and seeing that it's not this totally um linear or like perfect circle it might look more like a blob like <laughs> on it um so when we aim to learn how consent works our main goal is to empower people to um have more choice to have more um power in society so with that we must dismantle the idea that power is not equivalent of how worthy of respect you are just because someone has more power than someone doesn't mean that their life is per se more worthy than someone else's you can have all of the identities around the outer rim of this circle and still deserve to be worthy of respect just as much as the people in the very middle ring, you also deserve all of that power that people have in the middle ring as well. So basically, consent is a small practice that we can get into every day that will continue to empower people and gives people a place to kind of just sit with their own autonomy and choice in a place where oftentimes autonomy and choice are not the first option. Um, so another reflection that's important when we look at these sorts of wheels and we kind of look at where our own powers and privileges are, it's important to recognize that we are all capable of misusing our power and we are all capable of falling into the space of like harmful power leverages such as coercion, manipulation, um, and general harm. So 
one of the first ways that we can kind of start to mitigate that level of power is to acknowledge that you have it. And I think that that takes a lot of self-reflection and it's good. It's a good place to start when you can kind of observe where, where you, where you sit in the world. So we're going to get into sort of some consent basics. The Fry's model of consent is a model that Planned Parenthood coined. Um, I love this model. Um, I think that it's really easy to remember. I think that it's generally a like we love an you know we love an acronym. <laughs> um, also, I want to give a big shout out to Erica, our community director and graphic designer for making this adorable French fry graphic. Um, so fries refers to kind of this model of consent that you can check to make sure that you've kind of checked the boxes um, when you are creating a container for choice. Um, and that's that the consent is freely given. It's reversible. It's informed it's engaged and it's specific. The E in fries I have altered from the original Planned Parenthood version. Their version says enthusiastic, which while yes, enthusiastic consent is important, I think that it has some holes in it as far as some things, but we'll get into that when we get into the actual E section of it. So, so freely given. Also, uh, side note, this is Professor Unicorn. Professor Unicorn is featured in many of our pieces of consent literature and is also personified in our workshops as a puppet and is just generally, is, he's a total superstar. Just Professor Unicorn is a major, major celebrity at Guardians of the Vibe. And the unicorn will be asking some sort of reflective questions um, as we go through these slides to ask yourself um, when you are creating a consent based container. So when we look at freely given consent, that means it is without pressure, it's without coercion, it's without manipulation, and it's also while sober or while the other person is generally awake and aware of what is going on. And this is a place where we kind of start looking at how power and privilege play into this where it's like, where do you hold power and privilege when you're seeking freely given consent? Like what is the power dynamic when you are talking to someone about a consent-based choice that they get to make? Um, and does your place of power influence that, that person's response? Um, and you know, when observing that, how can you as a person with power mitigate that potential place where you could be potentially either manipulating someone without um without knowing it or just generally not realizing uh oh uh oh we crashed no second we can get back on it okay hopefully that doesn't happen again <laughs> The next one is reversible. It basically says that a person can change their mind at any time, even in the middle of an interaction, or if they have consented to an activity at a different time before. So this gives you the opportunity to check in to make sure that the other person has maybe not changed their mind um, about an activity that they've done in the past. Um, really a lot of what consent has to do with when we are re-engaging with people that we know or are in situations where um, or maybe working with friends or coworkers or partners or things like that. It really is a lot of rechecking in. And I think that consent based uh, structures get some flack for it being like, oh, it's just like too much it's too much checking in like it might like ruin the mood or it might like do x y and z like to make the other person feel weird but wouldn't you rather just know at the end of the day <laughs> uh how the other person feels um sometimes when what we perceive as potentially annoying is actually giving someone more of an actionable choice and what they want to do um i feel like a good example of this is like 
say for instance you tell your partner or roommate that you that you will let them borrow your car for a day and they go out and they borrow your car and then they borrow your car again uh without asking you but you had a thing to do that day and they didn't check back in but they're like oh you said that i could borrow your car you know that doesn't feel very good like they could have just been like can i borrow your car and then you could have said yes or no even though it ha has happened in the past so it is a lot of checking in um and it is a lot of accepting no uh even if you're expecting a yes informed is the eye of fries so that means that the other person knows the facts the risks and all of the information while they are sober and clear-headed and that means that you really have to practice radical honesty when we are creating choice um, for for people in our lives so withholding information or um manipulating information in a way to make someone agree to do something when they don't maybe have all of the real information is not consensual and oftentimes i think that we do this as a mechanism to get our way and we do this as a mechanism to sort of you know it's a it's a manipulation tactic that a lot of people do um i am guilty of it i have done it in the past i bet some of y'all have done it as well um but it is not a good practice and re practicing radical honesty in aspects of your life even if you know sometimes the truth is really uncomfortable um or might potentially drive someone to tell you no or that they don't want to um is something that we really have to sit with and we have to be ready to do that when we practice consent as an overarching whole like when it becomes like a greater practice in our lives being neutral to rejection is something that is vitally important and it is a very hard practice that practice of itself i think is the hardest part is accepting that you will be rejected often when you give people a real choice so sitting with that is can be difficult but that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it so the e is engaged i changed this from enthusiastic because i think that enthusiastic like we can still consent to something without being super stoked about it i think enthusiastic mostly comes from uh talking about uh enthusiastic yeses um in sex-based scenarios which i think is valid but i think that if we look at things such as people engaging in a consensual adult sex work or people who are even engaging in like general like just work that they don't feel passionate about like you're still consenting to do something even if you're like not stoked to do it so engaged i changed it to that um which means that you're feeling confident about the interaction um all of the information has been given people are clear-headed and you are also given the option to say no um or ask for more information um, a disengaged response to a choice that's given is silence maybe i don't know not now um those are things to kind of look out for also this is a part where people ask a lot about um nonverbal consent and nonverbal consent can look you know we know we sometimes know when people are enthusiastic non-verbally and we are sometimes aware of when people are not in, engaged or enthusiastic non-verbally but overall getting verbal consent from someone is somewhat more reliable than just depending on someone's body language so you really have to i think that when we look at like non-verbal consent it still takes a general um foundation of trust and understanding between people um, who want to engage in that type of consent. 
And then we have specific, which is the final little part of the acronym, which means that saying yes to one thing doesn't mean that it's a yes for all things. Um, so if you tell someone that they can borrow your car, but then they also, um, they not only drive it to the store, but then they also drive it like out of state and keep your car for the next like three days. Maybe that wasn't specific enough. And uh, there, there should probably be some more conversation around that. So again, this takes more checking in. Uh, it takes checking in even if it's something that you've done before um, or have you know engaged with in the past um i think that these all of these specific parts of the acronym really pay attention to kind of how we engage interpersonally and are less so about like um big overarching systems but some of these interpersonal relationships do exist in these systems so it's it's important to think about where they can all be applied. So here's one of the questions. Where can you implement consent more in your life? I would love to hear from people if anybody wants to take themselves off of mute or if you would like to write in the chat. Um, I would just like to take a second to kind of digest this little part here. I have one. Yeah. Um, in the workplace. I think that do I can should I put in my text? Um yeah, I think that specific part is really important, you know, because it comes back to that sort of but for me, I, rem I remember like the four agreements and things like this, but yeah, just not being specific enough and um and then having unmet expectations and then people not showing up and all that sort of things like that there's a consent on human time um and i think over communicating is you know a gift in that way and can be helpful um so that no one is left feeling kind of not um like they didn't fully agree to something and which is not a place that I would have normally thought about consent. I mean, you know, traditionally, like you said, we think about it from a sex perspective and then it, this the sphere broadens. But yeah, I think that in the workplace is a unique one. And I think, especially here in America, everyone's obsessed with working all the time. So it's a really good place to practice. Yeah, definitely. And there's also a lot of different power dynamics at the workplace that we can really observe, you know, especially if you are, running a business or if you are working in a place where there is like a hierarchy of people i mean <laughs> when you when you work for yourself and you like don't have a staff you're really having to like practice consent with yourself and things like that but yes like right. working in being in a workplace is definitely a place where i also think that more consent could be utilized yeah good question and amazing workshop Love you. Love too. <laughs> Does anyone else have thoughts, feelings? We'll move on otherwise. Well, I really like to think about this and, and mind you, um, I have um, had the opportunity of a couple like very unexpected like experiences that taught me some things about consent that I had never considered before um, when they happened. But there's the aspect of it that is in um, external in consideration for those that we are in community with. <clears throat> and then I think the part of it that like might be really um, the, the tricky part that ultimately then um, uh, feeds into then how we how we see it in the world around us is the part within ourselves and like what our own consent is and our you know and understanding those boundaries and so I, I really appreciate these conversations because they ask me to ask myself 
some of those places um, within myself that I might be um, unknowingly uh, granting permission without actually really internally giving consent to that. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I mean, a lot of this practice is hyper reflective. And like, I would say since taking my first consent workshop in 2015 to now, I would still consider myself a student of this practice and am still actively trying to reflect on how I am communicating my own boundaries and what I am actually okay with and not okay with and how that influences the choices that I personally make and the choices that are given to me by other people. So it's it, none of it is automatic and I think that it's ever changing just like we are like every day you know we wake up knowing ourselves a little bit more and like knowing our own personal consent is definitely part of the daily active practice of this. So thank you so much for sharing that. That's very valid. Oh yeah, Shant, what, what you got? Hi, um, thank you. I've, uh, I, I was just thinking a bit inspired from um, Alicia's um, question is this uh, just the, the unknown and its relationship to um, to answering those questions of of consent because it's like sometimes I go into something um, because that answer of consent I'm not I'm not I don't know actually the answer so I go into it and it's like I got to find out I guess through the experience and then it kind of you know that that's where the answer so it's like this relationship with with the unknown um and also just to recognize that, like consent as like a law of the universe, um, like a universal law that is like a principle. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to kind of bring that up. Um, yeah, thank you. It's I think that consent, while sometimes it can be unknown and sometimes we and that's the, that's also another reason why I think I changed enthusiastic was because like sometimes like I might be consenting to something but I might not have all of the information but like I'm still curious about it and like want to know more and participating in it might mean that I then form my thoughts on it but with that I should be able to decide how I continue interacting with that space like with like after engaging with it like that goes back with like reversible and like things like that so i'm I'm with you and the potential of maybe not knowing but still entering into it because you're curious or wanting to know more right the and the information and the learning process you know gathering and yeah jarno what you got Hi, um, I just thought, yeah, consent is just simple. I mean, and then I saw how you applied it to everything. And then I started to realize how important it is to me, how I deal from that kind of framework when at my workplace um, with other people. But then I realized the finest color, color of some situations where I realized that I can kind of bend things to my way um, because I really want to do something, for example, but also I just realized how some people kind of go along with it. And it's just a theme for me in my relationship, you know, um, me being quite a strong headed and my girlfriend who kind of, kind of can kind of go along with things. And I just realized that it's a great area of, um, possible friction and it was I'm really happy that you saw um, in it kind of made me aware of this finely tuned area yeah thank you you're so welcome Jarno that is a big reflection to like have and something to definitely dive deeper into like I said this is like such a crash course like in these concepts um, but yeah that's those are definitely valid feelings to have around how we receive consent and how we offer it to the world. You know, it's a 
It's a big undertaking to reflect. Ryan. Hi, I'm um, kind of hiding out through all of this. Um, this is an amazing, I've been having an amazing week with you all. Um, I work in the mental health system and um, I'm a peer specialist. So I use my lived experience of my emotional struggles to support people. And um, this was very relevant for my day because, you know, I think that, you know, people should have the ability to choose their providers, you know, what kind of care that they want. And, um, you know, in the mental health system right now, that's not happening. And um, so people are institutionalized against their will, um, they're forcibly medicated, and um, it's hard to see, you know? So my position is to, advocate with these people to have consent, to give consent for their care, right? So um, yeah, it was very moving for me because today, um, you know, there, there was someone that I support that someone else was trying to section and put them in a psych hospital against their will. And um, it's very important for people to like have choice and know what they're getting into and like you said, like have the ability to like back out if they want to. Um, so yeah, that's, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. And that really looks at a big overarching system in which consent is oftentimes withheld from people who maybe are in a more marginalized place on that wheel that we looked at and like, I think that's a really good example on a place that is really worthy of change. And like, I'm I'm really glad that there's people like you in there who are advocating for people's well-being and choice every day. That's really really important and vital work. Thank you. Thank you. Um. So, I have some more stuff about bystander intervention. We are having really nice conversations about consent. And so if other people would like to share, I'm happy to use the rest of my time with that. Or we can like move on and do like a super like blast off into space bystander intervention section that will be super fast. Um, so does anyone else have something to share on this topic here? Raise a hand, anything? Bless up. Hello. <laughs> All right. So basically the big picture of consent and like how we've been looking at it is it's complicated. It's not this binary black and white like thing. There are gray areas and there are places that oftentimes need more conversation and more just general work to have a better understanding. Uh, it involves a lot of internal work. It involves reflecting on where you hold power and privilege. It involves reflecting on what your own personal boundaries are and how you are giving consent and how you are um, showing up in this practice. And it requires checking in. It is a constant practice of kind of what we would perceive as maybe over communicating, but really that is kind of like, to me, the type of communication we should be striving for um, as a general populace. So bystander intervention is a concept that is more of like, actually it's more of a framework uh, than a concept. So it's a framework of public safety that is rooted in abolition and acts as kind of like a community skill set for a safer world. It acts as kind of like a web of socially conscious bystanders. And I do believe that if you have a better understanding of how consent works, you can be a more active bystander and you are better able to identify when maybe there is an unjust power dynamic or maybe able to identify uh, when someone needs assistance. And so we'll just go over a couple of just kind of little tips on how to to act in bystander intervention. So a bystander 
in general is just a person who is present at an event, but is really, they're just present there. An active bystander is someone who not only witnesses a, a situation, but takes the time to speak up or step in to keep the situation from escal escalating. Uh, this is ultimately a de-escalation practice. Um, actually, I just read today that Portland has a new de-escalation program uh, in town, which is very exciting, uh, in the public transit system. So there's not going to be any more um, actual transit police on our streetcars, but there are just people who are practicing de-escalation on the streetcars and who are also giving out resources um, and assisting with people who need help maybe getting to a houseless shelter or receiving warm weather supplies, things like that. So I was very excited to read about that today. Um, and that is an example of how these concepts can help create a more rounded future for us. So bystander intervention, um, it can be applied in a lot of different places. It can be applied intrapersonally Sometimes we have to intervene with ourselves. Um, sometimes we have to kind of be like, oh, I'm getting really heated right now and I need to maybe distract myself with something or I need to step away from this. Um, it can happen interpersonally where we see something happening and we're like, hey, I am going to step in here and apply uh, some knowledge to the situation and de-escalate it. It can happen within communities, so groups, um, so it can happen, you know, if we see a group of people who are enacting, you know, something violent and we are in another group that maybe wants to de-escalate that group, it can happen with more than one person. It can happen within systems. So I think a good way to look at kind of, uh, system intervention is actually, I, I actually think that things like Regenera Rising and like being in these communities together to intervene with things like the climate crisis or just generally talking about um, how we can intervene to make a better world and to birth ourselves into a new era. I think that is a great way to interact with a big system. Um, and then, yeah, those, those are just a couple of ways that we can apply these concepts. So when we think about bystander intervention, I think a big thing that comes up and something that we've all probably experienced is something, it's a psychological phenomenon called the bystander effect. Um, it basically plays off of this idea that the more people that are around, the less likely people will actively intervene. This is also known as the diffusion of responsibility. And it's important to recognize why this phenomenon happens. And some of it involves barriers such as maybe your gender is a barrier or maybe you want to stay anonymous maybe you don't have the skills to intervene maybe there's a language barrier maybe you don't have time and there's just many other scenarios barrier wise that can trigger the bystander effect so when we go to intervene in a situation this is a really this is five steps of risk assessment and i know it kind of seems like oh my gosh how am i going to do five steps while i'm trying to figure out how to intervene these things actually happen very very fast somatically in our bodies um, when we notice something that is potentially off um, in a situation so we notice the situation we have a gut check so like how does it feel in our body like is this something I need to engage with? What are the barriers of the situation? Um, you know, so we went over a couple of those barriers before. Um, and then assessing what resources are around that I might be able to seek help in intervening in this situation and to intervene safely. It is very important that we intervene as safely as possible. Um, there are not a ton of situations where someone who's engaging in bystander intervention is the person that the violence is then like put into, but as more tensions grow and as um, things get a little bit more heated, especially here in the United States, it is it can be hard to intervene safely in these days and times. Um, so stay safe out there when you're intervening. So I use the 5D model 
of bystander intervention. This is my favorite model of bystander intervention. It's kind of like the fries model where I feel like it's super easy to kind of pull out as like a toolkit of stuff. Um, so you've got the direct, the distract, the delegate, the document, and the delay. Um, let me see. Yeah, okay. So direct intervention means that you are engaging directly with the situation. So some of this, so with this, I think I'm going to mostly be using more like interpersonal examples, um, but just I know that like the same, um, is someone unmuted? I just want to check in. I'm hearing sounds. <laughs> um, so direct intervention is when we engage directly with the situation. So that means you see something, you've done the assessment, you've decided that there's not a ton of barriers holding you back, you feel like you're going to say something. I find that an effective way to directly engage with someone is if you see someone potentially being harmed, you talk to the person who's potentially being harmed. I would say that is the least confrontational way to do something. So you ask someone like, hey, are you okay? Do you need a friend? Like, can I walk you somewhere safer? Like, you know, something like that. If you need to di directly engage with the person potentially causing harm, that is okay as well. But sometimes people who are directly causing harm will manipulate a situation to where they can just continue to cause harm. So I think that you're gonna get a straighter answer um, if you connect with the person who is actively being harmed and they might tell you what they want you to do. Um, distract is one of my favorite uh, intervention techniques. Uh, I've, I used to share a video um, in my longer bystander intervention workshops of, it's like a five minute video of someone de-escalating a situation on a train or a bus or something like that. And like people are fighting. There's people obviously yelling at each other. They look like they're going to start getting physical. And some woman just stands up and starts singing, I'm a little teapot as loud as she can at the front of the bus and everybody's attention then turned to that person singing and the situation melted. Like it just like completely just melted. I think, you know, someone got off the bus that was in the midst of fighting. The situation had ended because this person was like, I am going to distract this entire bus of people. And so this it takes a little bit of creativity, which I'm sure a lot of y'all have in this space. Um, and I think that it's a very effective way to specifically just de-escalate a scenario. Delegating is an interesting one. Delegating kind of can fall into the diffusion of responsibility if you're not specific with what you are delegating or whom you're delegating to. So it's really important for when you delegate something that you have an idea of what you specifically need in that situation and who's going to do it. So sometimes I have, for example, been in a place where I feel like there's too many barriers for me to potentially intervene by myself. So I might ask someone who looks like they have maybe more power and privilege than I do to come with me in a situation. I'll be like, you there, points to person that you want them to help. Can you please come and help me intervene with a situation that I think looks unsafe? You can stand behind me during this time. Please don't become violent. I'm trying to de-escalate the situation. Or in a more extreme case, if you're, for example, in a really panic situation and if someone needs like an ambulance or medical help or something like that, uh, and you are, for example, administering first aid or something like that, you can point directly to someone, make eye contact with someone and say, you call an ambulance instead of saying someone call an ambulance, because then the diffusion of the responsibility will set in where maybe someone else thinks that everybody else is calling an ambulance and no one will do it. So it's important to be specific when we are delegating. Delay, um, that means that we're going to intervene, but maybe a little bit later than the moment. Um, I feel like this is actually a really valid form of intervention and can really show compassion, especially in situations where maybe you know the person 
who's being harmed and freeze or like don't know how to interact in that moment. I know that we've probably all been in situations where we're like, damn, I really could have done something in that situation, but I didn't. And now I feel weird and that I still want to help this person, but I didn't stand up for them in that moment. And that means that you can be like, hey, I saw what happened back there. It was violent and not okay. And I'm really sorry that I was unable to do something in the moment. Can I help you in this moment? Um, or it could mean that you confront somebody about something that they did. That could mean like, hey, what you said back there was um, really racist or what you said was um, very misogynistic. And I don't think that you should say things like that anymore. That is also bystander intervention. Um, document is one of the Ds and document is a complicated one because with the advent of cell phones and taking photos and videos and things like that, um, it's not a complete intervention. I really feel like document really needs another D with it in order to level the playing field a little bit. If you just take a video of someone being harmed and just have a video, it's not enough. So asking someone, this might look like you document and delay. So that means you take a video of a situation and you're like, hey, I wasn't able to engage in that moment, but I have a video of it. What would you like me to do with it? I'm happy to send it to you. I'm happy to delete it, whatever you need. Or it could mean you document and delegate to someone like, hey, I'm writing down this person's information or a description of what's happening. Can you call an ambulance? Like, you know, being very specific with who you're delegating to. But just documenting something is incomplete. Um, it's important to have a game plan for when you're done documenting. And don't ever share something that you have documented without the other person who's been harmed permission on the internet. I think this is like a phenomenon that we're seeing in the advent of cell phones and video and viral videos and things like that. So um, those are the five Ds. Uh, they are very helpful and good, good things to have in your toolkit. So let's think about barriers. I think this is a big one. I think like this is really at the core of like why we don't intervene. And I would love to hear from people or things like that about barriers that have held you back. Um, I would also like to say that we are, let's see. Ooh, I'm like running pretty low on time. Actually, yeah, I don't think I actually have time to take verbal thoughts on this question. Uh, but if people want to write in the chat about barriers that they have come into contact with when trying to engage in bystander intervention, I would love to read them and just kind of use it as a moment of like reflection and just understanding that sometimes it isn't safe to intervene. Like, and that doesn't make you a bad person, but sometimes it is genuinely unsafe to do it. And like, um, that might mean that the barriers that you have are very, very valid. Um, so feel free to share in the chat if you'd like. So the big picture is basically you have someone's back. Um, and that means you're looking out, you're doing those gut checks, you're, you know, saying something instead of not saying something. And that is really important and can really help someone out in a situation, especially people who feel like they're really unseen in situations of harm. Um, sometimes you might ask someone if they need help or you might recognize that a situation is really messed up and you checked in, you did all the things, you intervened, you did the stuff, but that person doesn't want to come with you. That person doesn't want to like engage with anything else after the fact or that person is going to just stay with the person that's harming them. Um, or sometimes it's a situation that doesn't even need attention. Sometimes like I've intervened in situations where people are like, we're fine. And I'm like, okay, cool. But better to be safe than sorry. Um, and also sometimes your interventions do not go as planned and that's okay. Sometimes we try to deescalate a situation, but the situation is so inflamed and so angry that like maybe it didn't de-escalate the situation and in fact escalated it and like that is always a huge bummer if that happens but keep in mind that it's better safe than sorry 
and you had someone's back in that moment and trying to figure it out and it's okay to show up imperfectly rather than not at all so this is just a general overview of the whole thing these are some questions to ask ourselves as we move forward in looking at consent so how will we apply consent in our daily lives how will we check in with our own power when navigating consent and how can we shift social and environmental systems with consent? This is such a big one that I've really been trying to focus on during my time in the design science studio. And I really feel like I've, I've felt, felt more ignited with that question than I ever have before after this time uh, working with my cohort. So for that, thank you. And I just have some like very quick closing words at the end here so in closing i love this image because it evokes the proverb many hands make light work and if we all do a little bit each day to recognize where we use consent and maybe where more is needed we can create a future where consent becomes part of the status quo instead of extraction and dominion if we step into our power to empower other others to advocate for themselves to speak honestly to say no and then to actually hold boundaries as a gift that we can see each other more fully i believe that with these tools we can heal the planet i want to imagine a future where the earth gets to use its own voice and we all listen so that's all i've got for today i am so glad that all of y'all were here to to learn with me and uh yeah i love the design science studio so thank you all so much i love you margie i'm crying <laughs> uh, invite anyone to feel free to unmute and share your thank you margie magic magic <laughs> thank, you, margie. thank you all so much also i think i'm going to pop into a breakout room for a little bit um if y'all would like to join me in there you are welcome to and we can chat a little bit more if you'd like i will join the overflow conversation room um, if anyone would like to chat more thanks again everyone thank you awesome thank you so much margie yeah and i love i mean really when we think about the ways that that uh, we experience um the systemic like the lack of consent within our systems and the, the source of frustration that that can be for people who who want to see the world in a different way um, understanding all these different areas of consent and really digging into some of that maybe uncomfortable areas you know is um is so important in us being able to re-empower ourselves to create those systems changes so thank you so much yeah <laughs> also just thank you Margie I enjoyed the presentation very much that's my dad Robert. thanks Hi, dad. <laughs> yeah. this is the first time that my dad has seen me do a presentation so thanks for being there for it everyone <laughs> yeah, I'm sure I loved it great information I learned a lot thank you that's amazing. Uh, Margie, thank you for being such a earth warrior and, you know, advocate of this work in the world. And you've continued, I'm not crying. You've continued to like keep making this work fun and accessible and help people not feel bad, you know, and like help people see where they're just kind of operating under um patterns that we may have not recognized and and uh the more considerate we get to be the better stewards we can be and the more likely we'll be able to make the world work for all so i love you <laughs> and thank you I recommend that you go uh, hang out with Margie in the breakout room and also that you play with Margie because Margie is fun to hang out with. <laughs> she, I heard some people you're going to meet. Did, did you meet Shanita last week? Did it happen? It will happen though. It will definitely happen. We're in touch for sure. <laughs> it will happen. Things will be born from it, I'm sure. Oh, I'm so excited. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you all so much I'm so honored that you are revolutionary of the studio and excited for more and 
your um, guardian of consent has wiggled through our earwaves every day. That makes me so happy. I'm so glad participating in this cohort has been absolutely amazing. And I can't wait to do more with y'all. So let's let's keep this train moving. Let's, let's keep the vision train moving, shall we say. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Well, I'm going to go into the breakout room. Y'all meet me in there if you want to chat more. And uh, thanks again, everyone. Thank you. And thank you, Guardians of the Vibe. Thank you, Margie, and thank you all for uh, being a part of this really important conversation. We are excited to have many more hours today of, of wonder and uh, information and creative explorations that are helping make a world work for all life. And uh, I'm gonna close the stream. If you're out there, come on in. Uh, we have amazing content for the rest of the day and for four more days. Four more days, five more days, four more days. Wow, amazing. And uh, special thanks to all our partners and all the creators and uh, 